on talking, you should feel free to um, ask any questions that you want. Um, so don't think that you can't ask questions till later. You can do it whenever you feel like it. Um, so let me start. I'm going to tell you a little bit about me, but I'll introduce myself um, to everybody. Um, I taught at Mount Holyoke College. I was in the philosophy department. I taught there until three years ago, at which point I retired. And um, I retired not to stop doing the work that I do, but because I wanted to devote more time to doing things like this and to writing. Um, so uh, when I started off at Mount Holyoke, I was, you know, pretty traditional philosophy professor. And, um, but as, my own, as I noticed that my own son uh, started asking questions that I could recognize as philosophical and I started discussing them with him, um, I got more and more interested in this whole idea of philosophy for children, which is something I didn't even know existed um, before coming to Mount Holyoke. Um, and I taught before uh, that for seven years and I've been in graduate school for a long time. So it was sort of surprising to me to discover um, that this field existed. But once you uh, start noticing it, and I'm sure since a lot of you, either with your parents, so you talk to your kids or your teachers and you talk to kids and you just notice kids um, have this ability to ask really deep questions and to think very um, clearly and carefully uh, about those questions. So um, when my son entered elementary school, I decided that I would, um, uh, my wife wanted me to um, be on the parent-teacher organization. And the thing I liked least about my job was actually going to meetings. So I thought, I don't want to do more meetings. So I decided, well, what can I do that somehow, I have some skill that would somehow enhance the, the school. And it was under, the school was then under pressure as it probably, they are today too, uh, with, they were the humanities offerings were being reduced in order to support STEM courses. And so I thought, well, I'll see if I can introduce philosophy um, into the curriculum and see what that's like. And in thinking about that, I thought that if I, um, if I were going to go in and ask teachers to teach a new subject, they would tell me I was out of my mind that there were, um, under such pressure to do all the things that they do already that they couldn't add something new to the curriculum. But one of the nice things about picture books is that <laughs> I discovered was that teachers were required to um, actually read picture books to kids and, and um, teach picture books. Uh, in addition to which they were supposed to, um, and that's probably true, this is a public school, so um, their state guidelines and they had to, um, it was called the, oral language skills. They had to teach oral language skills. And if you look at them, most, it's, they're sort of amorphous and it's unclear what you're, how to do them. And so I thought, well, if I could convince the teachers to use picture books and have philosophical discussions, not only would they be doing what they're supposed to be doing, but they'd be able to meet these oral language, to teach these oral language skills, which they had told me they could, they, a lot of them had trouble figuring out what to do. So that's how I hit on the idea of using picture books. And then uh, over the years, so this is, I've been doing this now for over 20 years. Um, it just, the, the picture books just grew on me. I just thought, wow, they're just so amazing. And they, uh, they present issues that kids are thinking about. And one of the reasons I think that in this time now, uh, when we're dealing with really difficult issues, one of the reasons that picture books are such a, present such a good opportunity for teaching uh, children is that you can take a topic, which if you ask the, a child to discuss directly, they get anxious or they wouldn't want to talk about it, maybe specifically with their parent. I mean, my son often didn't want to talk to me about stuff, but if, if you get a picture book, they can get engaged uh, and want to talk about the issue. And it's not, you know, direct between you and them. It's something that's um, mediated by the book. And so you can talk about, we're going to be talking about frog and toad. Um, you can talk about what frog and toad are doing. Um, and it's not quite as, you know, personal as it would be if you ask, uh, we're going to discuss, the topic's going to be about bravery. You know, do you think you're brave? 
when have you been brave? You know, children might answer that question, um, but they also might not really want to talk about it honestly. But when they get involved in the book, that actually can happen. So um, when I first started doing this, I didn't even really, um, I always said it was philosophy because it was a cool thing to say, but I didn't actually myself um, think we were actually having so much philosophical, just really engaging with um, books in an interesting way. But I do think, and I've learned over the years that these picture books are in fact, I think, um, animated by philosophical issues and uh, ethical issues that are really central to kids' lives. And kids are dealing with, you know, well, especially now, it's like, how do you make sense of what's going on? You know, children are, you know, they're having enough trouble just making sense of the ordinary world. And now they're in with this in pandemic, they're dealing with all sorts of new stuff, like all of us. And they need some way to process it. And I think having discussions with books that raise issues that are relevant to um, their situation uh, is a really good way to do this. So, um, you know, I've written uh, a number of books. I can't tell if you can see me because I, I can't. Can you see me? So, um, yeah. So one of the, the, the first book I wrote is called Big Ideas for Little Kids. And um, this is basically, I guess some of you know, this, this is like a how-to book to teach philosophy to, uh, to kids and ethics. And um, it's it, it, it originated actually in my class so the, the the fundamental basis was actually uh, worksheets for my students, but it's it it goes through everything you need to know to be able to teach philosophy to kids. And there's a there's a unit there's different sections of the book. One section contains um, eight picture books, and the philo philosophy behind them is discussed, and questions are, are listed. Um, and then um, I had this great idea which turned out to be not as great as I thought it was, um, and the press thought it was too, but they, um, it's called A Sneech is a Sneech and Other Philosophical Discoveries. And it's basically an introduction to philosophy for adults using picture books. Um, and this book also, um, when I first had the idea of writing it, I tried it out by teaching a college course, which used picture books. The whole course was basically, um, got my, my college students to talk uh, about the same issues that I'd had discussed with the younger kids uh, using picture books. And then I supplemented it by making them read, you know, adult philosophy too. But, um, and then I just was going to, there's a third book, which we don't have up there. It's called Philosophy in Classrooms and Beyond. A number of people have been inspired by my work and have developed different programs um, in different schools and different settings um, to teach philosophy. So that's the third one. And then um, as part of the course, can you go to the websites? As part of the course, um, when I first developed the course, I decided to uh, have a website in which the students would have to contribute um, what I call a module um, to the site. So that's the, the first one, teachingchildrenphilosophy.org. And um, I still remember the book that Ariel chose, which was Nuffle Bunny. And one of the great things about having the students choose books is I got introduced to all these picture books I didn't know about, which including Nuffle Bunny, despite the fact that the author lives in Northampton, Massachusetts, where I live. Um, and I've met him since then. But um, for those of you, so that that's basically, it's got over 150 picture books and they're organized by, um, it's alphabetical, but they're also organized by subject area. So you can go in and you can look under ethics and then under ethics, there'll be a bunch of other ones. Maybe if we have time at the end, I can show you how to navigate the site. The site is being migrated to um, DePaul University, and they're going to manage it from now on. So when I get super old, I don't have to worry about it. So it'll continue to exist, and it'll continue to grow. So it's always going to be up there. But if you look at it right now, it's a little funky because they're in, they made some mistakes. And you can see all these HTML codes that aren't supposed to be there. And I haven't gotten in touch with them. I have to find out what's going on. But it'll, it'll keep going, and then eventually it'll seamlessly transfer to another site. Um, a filmmaker made a film about my work, and she got really interested in it. And then she came up with the idea of uh, what's the big idea pr program. And, and that's uh, for middle schoolers. It, it, um, 
uses clips from video and film to discuss ethical issues. And the five ethical issues were ones that um, students in Holyoke, Mass, which is near here, she was working with in the school and she did a survey and she asked the kids, what were the most important ethical issues that you were facing? So things like bullying and peer pressure. Um, and then we just used, you know, I had, we had to find clips from films um, and TV programs that would um, raise those issues. And the only reason it's not good for elementary school kids is that some of the issues, probably the content might be a little too advanced for them. So just a warning. And then the final one, I just decided, <laughs> I've always been interested in art and I just, I, uh, when we used to bring the, we, at the end of the course, um, so not when Ariel was there, but later on we worked, uh, for over a decade, we've been working at a inner city charter school in Springfield, Mass. And since those kids are kids who would not naturally think about college as being on their radar, um, I always brought them up to campus at the end of the course. And one of the, we went to different sites that would interest them, a chemistry lab, a bio lab with cool little creatures and machines and the college organist would show them how an organ worked. And then we'd go to the art museum. And I was really struck by um, kids' interest in art and ability to talk about art. So the final um, site, is um, uses works of art to raise all sorts of philosophical issues. But when I designed that site, I made it more for high school students, just to sort of, so an elementary, a middle, and a high school uh, website. But you can adapt that one to work with younger kids too. So um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna, um, we're gonna engage in a philosophical discussion based on a picture book. So you're gonna be in the place of the kids, although you don't have to act like second graders, you can act like adults. Um, but you, you're gonna have a discussion and this is the first time I've done it on Zoom. So uh, it's an experiment in terms of how we can actually have a conversation. And so the basic ground rules um, I've refined down to an acronym of SWA. Um, <clears throat> and the idea is that uh, and this is what I would tell students, right? That you're, this is what you have, these are the rules for having a philosophy discussion. You have to say what you think, so speak. You have to listen carefully to what other people say. Um, that's a real challenge for kids. Actually, I think it's a challenge for all of us. We all like to talk and we don't like to listen. Um, but it's very important that you listen. And um, I can tell you some techniques you can use to enforce that one uh, if you have questions about that. The A stands for agree or disagree. Um, and that's the thing that kids always remember about philosophy when they leave, is that you have to figure out whether you agree or disagree with what other uh, people say. And then finally, you have to, the W says why, that you have to come up with a reason that supports what you think. So it's, philosophy is not so much about what you think, but why you think what you think. So these are the basic uh, rules for taking part in a philosophy discussion. And um, there's some other rules about you know, treating people nicely, but these are the ones that are more cognitive rules about the skills that you have to um, be able to uh, use and employ to have a philosophy discussion. So um, I went on too long probably, but we're gonna, we're gonna read to you now um, Dragons and Giants. And when I first started doing this with college students, the college students would read these books like they were reading a, philosophy paper and they you know and so we had to work um on getting them to sort of put some emotion into it um after ariel's time i actually had a storyteller who would come in and help help the students understand how to do that but okay without further ado so i, I assume you all know arnold labelle is uh one of the classic uh picture book writers and illustrators and um he has a series of at least three maybe four um Frog and Toad books, and Frog and Toad are Friends, which is the title of one of the other books, and uh, we'll go on one of the, their adventures with them. Okay. Actually, I don't have to use my book. Frog and Toad were reading a book together. The people in this book are brave, said Toad. They fight dragons and giants, and they are never afraid. I wonder if we're brave, said Frog. Frog and Toad looked into a mirror. 
We look brave, said Frog. Yes, but are we, asked Toad. And by the way, just look, there's the book that they're reading is a book of fairy tales. So the reason that they're dragons and giants is the, you know, the stories of, you know, knights and shining armor and lady damsels in distress and uh, dragons and giants that the knights have to fight. Frog and Toad went outside. We can try to climb this mountain, said Frog. That should tell us if we are brave. Frog and Toad went leaping over rocks and Toad, oh, Frog went leaping over rocks and Toad came puffing up behind him. They came to a dark cave. A big snake came out of the cave. Hello, lunch, said the snake when he saw Frog and Toad. He opened his wide mouth. Frog and Toad jumped away. Toad was shaking. I am not afraid, he cried. They climbed higher and they heard a loud noise. Many large stones were ro rolling down the mountain. It's an avalanche, cried Toad. Frog and Toad jumped away. Frog was trembling. I'm not afraid, he shouted. They came to the top of the mountain. The shadow of a hawk fell over them. Frog and Toad jumped under a rock. The hawk flew away. We are not afraid, screamed Frog and Toad at the same time. Then they ran down the mountain very fast. They ran past the place where they saw the avalanche. They ran past the place where they saw the snake. They ran all the way to Toad's house. Frog, I am glad to have a brave friend like you, said Toad. He jumped into the bed and pulled the covers over his head. And I'm happy to know a brave person like you, Toad, said Frog. He jumped into the closet and shut the door. Toad stayed in the bed and Frog stayed in the closet. They stayed there for a long time, just feeling very brave together. Okay, I should show you this way. Thank you, Heather. So next time I, you can have, you can actually have Frog and Toad do the discussion if you want when you're dealing with kids. But these are, I got these at the Eric Carl Museum. Okay, so uh, we're now gonna have a discussion. Do you think it might, I think it might be better to put everybody back up on the screen so that we can see who's asking questions. And I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna go to the- Okay, everyone should shift to gallery view. Yeah, because we're trying to have a discussion. Um, now you're going to have to remember the book because we can't both have the book up and this, but we can go back to the book if we need to. So, so at the end of the story, Frog and Toad are sitting in Toad's house, trembling. One of them's in the closet, one of them's under the covers. And they both say, it's so great to have a brave friend like you. So do you think they're right? Are they brave? Each one says to the other that they're brave. So. Are they? So if you just want to unmute yourself and talk, and we'll just try to mediate talking over each other. Just since there's two panels, it will be harder for me to nominate people. I'll go. I, I think they're brave. Um, I think they're brave because even though they're afraid, they keep on going. Does anybody... Uh disagree with that? <laughs> I, sorry, I think they're brave because they have each other to help them be brave. I so, think they're brave because they believe that they're brave. They believe in themselves. Okay, other opinions? I think we have to define brave. I, I, I'm not sure if they're brave. They're hiding in the closet at the end and they spend most of the story running away. So I'm willing to consider that they might be brave, but I'm not convinced. Okay, well look, um, the book gives us, the story gives us a little, a little bit of help here because um, early on, Toad says, the people in this 
book are brave. They fight dragons and giants and they are never afraid. And that's not a definition of bravery, but it gives us a necessary condition on bravery because it says if you're scared, you can't be brave. People who are afraid, afraid never feel yeah. fear. Because they're afraid the whole time. Yes. I think they are very afraid and they run away from everything. So not, they're not really brave, but that doesn't mean that they don't think that they're brave. They just do not have an understanding of what it means to be brave from what they've read yet. So they still need to learn that. I feel like they're great because they ventured out in the first place. They could have stayed under the covers and in the closet the whole day. Yeah. They used each other to help each other along, convincing themselves that they were brave. And maybe their definition of brave was a little bit flawed. Maybe they really are brave, but they just were thinking you, to be brave, you have to do this fighting dragons and all this other stuff. But maybe being brave is just doing something really scary. So what do we think? So, oh, so now we're... So... I think they think each other is brave and that that emboldens them finally in the end. So what if being brave, maybe their definition in the beginning is wrong. They're saying it's to never be afraid, but it sounds like we're saying it's to do something even when you're afraid. Yeah. What do we think? Um, do you think that uh, Toad's attempt at characterizing bravery is mistaken? And that's why it's okay to say that they're brave at the end, even though they're scared. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I think I, they're brave because they face their fears. They they okay. went out there and they saw the dragon. They they may have run away, but they didn't get eaten. And I, you know that's what I said before. <laughs> but I don't think you can hear me. <laughs> so they, you know, in their mind, they got home safely. They were great. Can't you be scared when you do go off and do something yeah. brave? I mean, sure. I'm scared yeah. all the time. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was brave looking at the snake, by the way. Isn't that the definition of bravery is when you're like, you're afraid, but yet you still push yourself on. Yeah. And then you do continue your journey and then you ultimately get to where you need to be. And then you're like, oh, that was awful. And then you're like, but I did it. And so I think, I don't know, that was my take on it. I guess so, yeah. I'm a little confused about like, what is their journey? Like, is their journey just to be going up the mountain or is their journey to like face something like the hawk and not run away? Because that might determine whether or not they faced their fears like what Lynn was saying. Maybe they didn't know until they got there. <laughs> oh, so you don't need to know what the journey is? No, do we ever really? Well, let's start. Why they... <laughs> so the journey is the journey. In the story, they start out by looking in a mirror, and, the, and they say, we look brave, but are we really brave? And then they say, well, let's climb a mountain. Why would climbing a mountain be something that would help them figure out whether they're brave or not? Because maybe they never usually climb the mountain. Maybe they just go on a flat road. So what, and what's it about climbing a mountain that requires bravery? Maybe they're afraid of yeah. heights. Excuse and me? now that maybe they're afraid of heights and now they have to go up somewhere high. Maybe, uh, I don't know where else I don't know. That's populated with avalanches, snakes. <laughs> the unknown, they're entering the unknown. But it's also, it's dangerous. Sure. Right? Really... So they're, they're doing something dangerous. Right. Um, and that's that's like the knights fighting dragons and you know dragons and giants. It's you know they could get killed, right? So it's a dangerous thing to do. Um, if if we had a whiteboard or a blackboard, I would be putting down some of the concepts that have been raised. So, um, call this a concept map or a, an idea map, so that we have um, we have bravery, we have fear, we have danger. We have perseverance. We have um, risk. Risk, yeah, risk is important, especially these days. Um, so there's, there's a, what, what's going on is we're talking is we're sort of develop, we're we're thinking about the relationship between these different concepts and we're developing a more complex understanding of the concept of bravery by relating it to other concepts and thinking 
you know, what we start out with Toad's claim that uh, fear and bravery can't go together. And then we're thinking about, well, what's the relationship between danger and fear? Someone said that, um, you know, that, that um, Yes, making good choices also is also important. And if you're encountering a snake or an avalanche or a hawk, perhaps running away is the brave thing to do. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. What? What? What's? What? You're in an avalanche. What are you supposed to do? You know, I used I put up a picture of Tarzan sometimes. You know, beating his chest. You know, going, ah. You know, and let the rocks knock you down. You know, that's not brave. That's stupid. Right? <laughs> so. Stupidity or not the relationship between bravery and intelligence is actually interesting too. So um, it's another concept to think about. Self-preservation. Excuse me? I couldn't hear. Self-preservation, she said. Ah, self-preservation. Yeah. <laughs> you can't be brave if you're not alive. <laughs> True enough. As we all know <laughs> these days. I wonder also if it says something about like insecurities and self-confidence because um, they were both, I guess, individually still a little fearful after it, but yet they saw they saw the other as brave and maybe that was, they, they both did the same thing, um, but they couldn't necessarily know if the other was still afraid. So they're like, they doubted themselves, feeling like they might still be afraid, but they saw the other as having been brave because they did it and didn't exhibit fear. Yeah, so that, you know, that, that raises the question of, is, is bravery uh, about doing certain types of actions or is it about how you experience doing those things? And also this, a number of you have said, you know, there's a, um, the fact that the two of them are together is important, right? That if it just been one of them, it might've been very different. But when you have, when you're doing something with a friend, right, because they're, they're good friends, um, they're best friends, um, it can be really different. So the experience of climbing the mountain with a friend is very different than uh, climbing the mountain by yourself. I think it also raises the question of whether bravery can only be um, attributed to you by another person. So like, and whether a friend is the best person to call someone else brave like, because they know you. Um, Nina had her hand raised. Nina, do you still wanna talk? Yeah, um, sorry, let's do this. Yeah, I was just thinking about um, the definition of uh, bravery because my almost five-year-old uh, keeps talking about, oh, I was so brave. I did this and that. Uh, I managed to do certain things uh, and while, you were reading the book, I was thinking, if I read this book for her, I want to ask her the same question, if she thinks the frogs, <laughs> you know, were they brave? Um, and um, just going back to what you just mentioned, you know, is bravery doing, you know, something specific or managed to do or facing fear? It's an interesting question. Right, so then that relates also to what Ariel was saying, which is what are the criteria for attributing bravery to somebody, is it, or yourself? Can you attribute bravery to someone on the basis of how they act, or do you need to know something about what's going on inside them, how they're experiencing it? Um, Nina's comment um, and about Celine uh, is reminding me of what I was thinking, that uh, bravery, like beauty, is in the eye of the beholder, perhaps? Mm -hmm. Rodney, is it your eye and other people's eye? Like my... Um, I think in the eye of the beholder, uh, how you may... So it, it can be everyone's eye at some point when they are beholding. <laughs> I don't know. That that idea just, you know, came to me when I, um, you know, as Nina was talking about how a little five-year-old might perceive it and how they might see themselves. So normally when people say beauty is in the eye of the beholder, what they mean is that um, beauty is not an objective property of objects, but it has to do with our reaction to mm -hmm. it. So when we see something, 
whether when we say it's beautiful, but we're not talking about it the characteristic of the object, we're talking about our emotional reaction to it. Mm -hmm. And so it's very subjective. So there's not a matter of fact about whether the Mona Lisa is beautiful to choose. Right. Right. It's just, it depends on people's reactions. Well, what about and so in that context, um, if you think about the reactions of frog and toad, again, um, here they're in the closet, they're under the covers, complimenting themselves for being brave. Uh, so it's how they're perceiving, you know, themselves regardless of the action. Well, the one on the outside might see those behaviors as um, cowering and um, covering themselves up. I don't know. Yeah, just a thought. The flip um, side to that, I think, um, I think about if somebody saw you know, in the eye of the beholder, somebody saw someone who they thought, oh, wow, what you did was really brave. But the response of that someone could be, you have no idea how terrified I was. And so I don't necessarily think it was brave because I was terrified. Right. And so again, the relationship of the inner person and the experience of it versus the impact of it to those on the outside. I, Dr. Rizak, I agree. I, this reminds me of when we, when you had the ethics, um, there was a institute that we, I went to with you and it was about when you saw somebody who was homeless living in a car and it was like, well, can I help you? And you were, and they were like, no, or it, cause it, it makes you think about what the other person wants or needs. And I think that bravery and trying to describe that is basically the same thing. It's what do they really think that it is? It could be very different from somebody else. Chris, you want to let me talk? Yeah, I was just going to say, I've always thought that a definition of bravery was being scared stiff, but doing whatever you had to do anyway. And uh, I don't know that it's so much of a personal interpretation. I don't know if you come through something harrowing and still say, well, uh, I did it, so I'm brave. But the fact that you might say, I did it anyway, um, exhibit some form of bravery, even though I was very scared. I think there's a real social dynamic here too, to bravery. I think about how many heroes we hear about even right now. Um, and oftentimes the heroes report themselves, well, I'm not a hero. What did I do? I just did what I needed to do. But it, it's like there's the, the, the community as a whole needs the heroes to help us be brave, whether they are or not personally. <laughs> so um, I'm just paying attention to the time and I want us to have enough time to reflect on what's just happened. So I think this might be a good time to end this part of our session and begin a process of reflecting upon what we've just heard. So um, I'll make a couple of comments and then I want to open it up to you and, and ask you to um, share your reaction either to the content of the discussion or the nature of the discussion or whether you think this would be a useful um, thing to do with kids in our current situation. Um, I just want to say um, that the, the children, when you read the book to the children, my experience is that they initially all think Prague and Toad are not brave because they're scared. And then as I start thinking about it, one or two of them will tentatively say, well, actually, they seem pretty brave to me because they did these things. And they'll come up with actually something very similar to what a number of you have said, which is that bravery really is persevering in the face of fear. So it's not not feeling the fear, but it's not letting the fear completely overwhelm you to the point where you can't do what you want to do or need to do. And so that's actually, you know, I find that just incredibly um, and these, I mean, I've mostly been working with second graders for a bunch of years because of restrictions on where standardized testing starts hitting schools um, in Massachusetts, which is third grade. So we could work with second graders because they weren't yet worried about the tests. And the second graders just, you know, come up with this, you know, pretty much spontaneously on their own and um, do a great job of, of thinking about it. Um, one of the reasons that I think it's very important to discuss bravery with kids is that the images that they get from the mass media about bravery are really destructive, I think, because they, they mostly see superheroes, 
right? When they think who's brave, and one of the things you can do is just give me an example of somebody who's brave, and they often will come up with whatever the contemporary version of Superman is, you know, somebody who does all these incredible things, but they have superpowers. And so they don't, they don't have the sort of normal uh, fear response that a human being would have, because aside from kryptonite, nothing can kill Superman. Um, so, and if the kids are starting to think that they should be like that, it's gonna really be bad. And so I think one of the things that's really helpful about talking about bravery and getting them to see the role that fear pl plays in bravery, because I actually think uh, uh, fear is like a marker of a dangerous situation that calls forth the need to be brave, that um, it's a real good, important corrective to some of what they might be thinking when they're just reacting to sort of mass media images of superheroes and other um, brave people. So, um, and I, I guess I, I just also maybe mention now that we could, this, any discussion that you have on a book like this can go in all sorts of different directions depending on what you choose to ask about first. And um, Ariel and I were talking about whether it would be interesting to sort of think about the fact that they climb a mountain, which is dangerous and risky, and you can have a whole discussion of risk. You know, was that, was that a reasonable thing for them to do or was it too risky should they have not done it? And these days when we're all facing the question of, you know, how do we get out of our houses? What counts as risky? What's too much risk? What's not, um, what, what's not? That, that everything is risky and some things are reasonable risks to take and some aren't. How do we decide that? You can get into all that too, just on the basis of the story. So I now want to give you the opportunity to share with each other and with me um, your reaction to the discussion. And um, again, one of the issues is, do you think that having these sorts of discussions with kids would be helpful? in this time uh, when the kids are having to deal with so much and such difficult issues in their lives. Um, or you can just talk about the book and our discussion and what you found interesting, uh, if anything, in it. I think this or, subject is uh, very relevant, uh, Dr. Wartenberg, with uh, Ken Place, one of our mottos is teaching brave and brilliant girls. And I think this would be a great discussion to start in the beginning of the year to really, you know, lay a fire under them, pump them up and help them understand what, what do we mean by that? I think the concept of bravery and frog and toad here, though, is a little bit problematic um, because bravery in the way we would normally think about it would imply that there is something worth taking a risk for. Right, we don't value, um, we don't want to encourage kids to value, certainly, risk taking just to take risks, just to be brave, which is sort of what frog and toad do, right? There's no real purpose other you know, than taking those risks so they can say they're brave. Um, so that's something you have to, I think, enter into carefully with children. I, I think the whole discussion of decision making with that risk taking is a really good offshoot of this for kids is like, the actual steps of a, of a good decision and what happens when you don't make good decisions. What are the consequences? What are the pros? What are the cons? It makes kids think about before they quickly take, a, you know, do something to think through it. Yeah. And that, I think that kind of ties in with, um, when you were mentioning about superheroes and the extreme, you know, that really they're not facing a big risk. Um, whereas, as Amanda mentioned, you know, now there's more attention on the bravery of everyday people who are going to work in a supermarket or healthcare workers who, you know, are really taking a risk and doing it anyway. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to somehow, um, you know, start a conversation with children. They need to be talking about what's going on um, in a, a non-scary way. Um, 
you know, uh, we were ha we had an eco team meeting just an hour ago, and um, just allowing them to talk about you know what ifs for next year, and to get allowed them to start talking about how they were feeling right now and what they were frustrated with or what they were, you know. So I think that. Um, you know, th these kinds of conversations, whether it starts with a picture book or starts with an image or starts with, you know, a wearing a mask. Um, it's really important that we all start having these conversations now because there's a lot of stuff that they're thinking about that they don't even realize until they start talking. And I, I would agree with that, that um, it is incumbent upon us to create these spaces and these opportunities for children uh, to talk. And if we can facilitate it through uh, picture story books, then I think it definitely has relevance and it's applicable to where we are now. Um, you know, children have been traumatized. We all have been traumatized by this event. We just haven't had time to pause yet to really experience and think just how much we have been traumatized. Um, but um, there's a lot of research about the um, adverse effects of trauma in lives of children. And so I think that we will have to be forward thinking and proactive when it comes to this. And so um, one reason why I was particularly excited about today, Dr. Wartenberg, is because I do think we have to create those spaces. And sometimes it's best to go at them indirectly than to say, okay, we're well, now going to talk about the trauma that you faced yeah. during the yeah. pandemic. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, you know, just to create uh, opportunities for their voices uh, to be lifted and heard. Yeah. And so I, many kids don't, oh, I'm sorry. No, I was just saying that as a parent, I was really looking forward to hearing this um, just because, you know, she, they, my kids are at home and, you know, Alex is leaving and she's wanting to, how do I, how does she explain how she's feeling when she can't talk to her friends and she wants to say goodbye, but she can't say goodbye. And it's, you know, I, I'm, I was looking forward to finding out how to present challenging issues and uh, so that she would be able to talk about what she needed to talk about without saying, hey, how you feeling? <laughs> There's a great, uh, another one of the frog and toad stories. I was thinking about this. It's not in this book, it's in a different book. Um, might be Days with Frog and Toad. It's called Alone. And it's one frog wants to go off and be by himself for a day and it makes Toad completely crazy. Um, and I thought in, at this time when the kids are missing their friends, um, the whole issue of what is it to be alone and is it, is it, is, is it necessarily a bad thing is a very, and there's, it's right there in that story um, without actually having, you know, again, as you're saying that sometimes it's easier for the kids to talk about stuff indirectly rather than having to, so I think, how are you traumatized? You know, you, know, you don't want to. You don't want to make things worse, right? You want to try to help them rather than make it worse. And I think on that note, sometimes children, I don't want to say don't know or don't even understand what they're feeling. Um, I know that's a conversation, you know, I have with my daughter a lot. Um, when I can see, by the way, you know, she's acting or, um, but she doesn't quite understand or grasp what she's feeling. Um, so I think sometimes allowing for these types of discussions um, or however they may come up, you know, it, it allows them not even in the moment, you know, later on to realize it and then maybe make the connections there because I do think, you know, that's how children in general and then even currently with what's going on, I don't know, I think maybe for some, even for adults, you know, there's so much going on and, and we're feeling so many different things that it's, you know, you can't just say, well, I'm sad and I'm, I'm, you know, scared. It, it, there's so many pieces there. So sometimes through these discussions, they all start coming out <laughs> without even realizing it. And you can talk about that and how you can feel lots of things at one time. Um, Cause you know, I think that's hard not just for children, for adults, I think it's hard for everybody sometimes to figure it out until at some point there's talk about it without even being directly about what happened. <laughs> Maria, what you just said made me think that maybe Tom, Karen, and Audrey would like to jump in and perhaps Joanne too about 
what are some strategies that you use when you're having a conversation? Because things just blurt out, right? And it might catch you from left field and you might not feel equipped to deal with it. Or there's this big topic and you're not quite sure how best to start. Like, yeah, you have a picture book, but then what do I do? Like if nobody says anything. Um, so are there any strategies that any of the experts in the room have? Um, I, was, I was always a afraid that they would not say anything, but um, it, they, they always had something to say. And then this process with all of you, I've never done it with an adult, but I've done it with children. And so it reminded me how we, um, your, what you're thinking is enriched by other people's thought, because I, I went first and I said my thing. But then by the time we got to Amanda, I was like, wow. And I changed my perspective. And I've seen that happen over and over again with the third graders. Uh, we've uh, read these stories too. And that they really, the, the great thing is that they really listen and then try to change perspective. Not because their, you know, their friends said something, but because they're really thinking about the ideas. And I think it's so valuable. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the one of the really um, good lessons uh, to teach is that what's being discussed here is not a particular person's idea, but it's it's the idea itself, right? So somebody actually expresses it, but then that's you, you want to look at the idea, and so you can criticize it without criticizing the person who expressed right. it, because you want to be looking at the idea and thinking about its validity, um, and that that means you know we we foster disagreements uh, in the classroom because that's the way you can get at, you know, you can get deeper and, and, and think more coherently about these issues because they're complicated. And, um, you know, I didn't ask you, but if, at the beginning, if you, what's bravery, you probably, you know, we would have a very sort of simple answer. I mean, most of us would. And then by talking and listening to everybody, you start thinking, oh yeah, I hadn't thought about, um, that aspect it's easier to be brave when you have a friend to be brave with than when you're on your own or uh that um you know bravery might be something that's very subjective and you can't really tell if someone's brave just by looking at what they're doing it depends on other factors um but i, I also i mean i was you know i guess in this situation i wonder what kids would say um if you ask them a, a, an example of somebody who thought they were brave, whether they would res would respond by talking about the sort of superhero type stuff, which is what kids used to talk about, or whether they would say, you know, the the nurses at the hospital who are facing death every day to keep people alive, you know, and then that that brings it down from this level of fighting dragons and giants to dealing with, you know, fear. Well, fear of death, right? Um, which is something else that every, you know, kids probably don't think, I don't know how much kids think about death <laughs> in general, but I'm sure they're all thinking about it now a lot more. Um, and uh, particularly if they have elderly grandparents or caretakers. Um, I mean, I know my, my son who's 26 is really worried that I'm gonna somehow get sick and die, you know? Um, He's constantly checking up on me, making sure that I'm not exposing myself unnecessarily to risks. Um, so there's, I think that in this time, things are really changing. And I think giving the kids a chance to talk and think about this is really, really important. Um, and indeed for all of us, you know, we're all, the trauma is not just kids, right? We're all traumatized in one way or another by what's going on, um, even as we get used to living with it. I mean, that's the other thing is that we sort of acclimate ourselves to living in a transformed world. Um, but I think having these discussions is really helpful uh, for everybody. Um, Adney, do you have anything you'd like to add? I can really open up that can of worms and it goes into that area. Anything? Uh, no, I really appreciate um, this thread of conversation. Um, you know, going back to uh, Dr. Wartenberg's um, intro, I think what was important about how the questions were phrased is that they were open-ended. And uh, as much as we try to talk about mistake-making and risk-taking and 
you know, um, thinking independently, you know, children still um, tune into the cues, the body language of what's the right answer or what's the wrong answer, what is it that the teacher wants me to say, et cetera. And so I think um, following a, a story, just really truly providing enough options through an open-ended um, forum is key. And I think that's key when we begin to talk to children um, without having an agenda, but just see um, where they go with it. Uh, I do think though that if we are going to use these books or use books to try to um, provide an opportunity for children to chat, um, teachers too have different levels of tolerance and understanding and, and, and patience. And so it might behoove us to get a little, you know, training or insight or to take our own pulse as to what we feel that we could handle in case something, you know, comes up or we'll just be aware of the resources that might be there to serve as a, um, a safety net for us. Yeah. I think that's important um, when you do these sort of, I think we are, the, the whole technique is one that's based on asking open-ended questions mm -hmm. where, um, you know, the, the person leading the discussion probably doesn't really know the answer, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of these philosophical questions have been debated for thousands of years and um, they'll continue to be debated uh, and there isn't like, this established answer that you have, and that's something that it takes some, it takes bravery to be willing to lead a discussion when you don't know what the answer is and you don't know where it's going, right? I mean, I've learned, it's, it, when I first started doing this, it was like the scariest thing. Like when I faced a group of first and second graders, and I, uh, I had to lead this discussion and I had no idea what was going to happen and it was very scary, you know, and you sort of have to like decide it's worth it and you're going to do it anyway. Um, but it, one thing that can happen is that you can inadvertently trigger certain um, psychological reactions in kids that can be a little nerve wracking and um, you have to be ready to deal with that. I've, it's happened to me very, very rarely. But um, one of the other stories in this book is called The Dream. And the whole issue of what, how we can tell if we're dreaming or not is a big, this is like a, one of the old chestnuts in philosophy. And, um, but it turned out that, that when in the class we, we started talking about dreaming, it turned out like one kid had these nightmares all the time. And so it was like, he got triggered by that discussion. Um, and it was surprising to me because it's a discussion that I'd had a lot of times and there's never a problem and in this one context it is. And so you have to be, um, you know, when I was doing it, there was a teacher in the room and the teacher could, you know, help the kid. But um, you, do, you do have to be aware that it's possible that something will happen and that you have to then somehow cope with it. But my experience is it doesn't happen very often. Um, but of course, we're in, living in transformed circumstances now where um, a lot of anxiety is right, right, right at the surface, whereas before it was sort of buried. Uh, I think all of our anxieties are like, you know, the ghosts are, are circulating um, much more close to the surface, which is why, but, but that's also why we should, this, these discussions can be so valuable. Um, thank you, Tom. I think that Karen would like to add a few things and then to be mindful of room time, we're going to wrap up very shortly. Mute. One of the, th one of the things I was going to say, um, Dr. Wolberg and Dr. Anderson have also alluded to, which is, you know, sometimes these open-ended conversations that you're facilitating um, a child can become scared, a child can say something, and um, you're faced with how do you respond, especially if you're talking about something like bravery. And, um, you know, I've always found, and, and mind you, most of my career was spent with middle school, so, you know, ages 10 to 14. Um, it was very important to be honest, but to always give hope, um, you know, with students. So I, I recall so vividly one of the sixth graders on 9-11, um, came up to me after the assembly and was literally shaking and said, you know, Dr. Rizak, are we going to be okay? Are we going to be okay? I had no idea we were going to be okay. Okay. 
And uh, it was like one of those moments that will live forever in my mind. And I thought, well, I'm not going to say, I don't know if we're going to be okay. The child is 10 years old and is frightened, but I'm also not going to say, yeah, everything's going to be great. Cause I had no idea. So I just recall saying, you know, it's a very scary time right now, but whatever happens, we're all here together and, you know, we're going to, to make it through whatever. So I don't know if that was the right thing to say or not, but I always found that the kids always know an honest person from a not honest person. And, you know, to say it's, it's okay, you know, to say that things aren't true, that, that to me just confuses them. So to do so in a way that's gentle, that's honest, that's sincere, that's authentic, but that is always hopeful and that the children feel safe and, and, and safe and protected by the adults in their lives. Um, I, one final thing I want to say is we, of course, uh, have launched our, our attempt at providing stories for children to talk about philosophical and ethical issues which is the B program, Be Ethical Everywhere. And I must tell you that we are very honored not only to have Dr. Wartenberg here today, but to have the author of the original Beatrice story. Sally Ziner is with us today. She is a participant. And so, um, and one of the things that I think is really, really important is that we are going to have to do professional development um, and talk, have more conversations like these, you know, as the adults who are the role models, who are the ones who will be working with children on some of these issues. So Beatrice, you know, gets into all kinds of trouble and ethical dilemmas. Um, and so I really, I hope you've seen the reveal bit videos um, and if you haven't, please respond to the survey as well. Um, and uh, I really want to thank uh, Odney and uh, Marie and Stacy and Joanne, uh, who are on the committee, who've been editing Sally's great story. And uh, of course, Ariel. And then um, Ruthanna and Lori for lending the voices and David for the music. But all of it, again, is with the goal of really helping to develop these ethical leadership skills and these skills of authenticity in our youngest learners. And so I'm so grateful to Ariel for bringing Dr. Wartenberg here today and for really launching this whole discussion about bringing philosophy to the age group. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Um, if you have any questions for Tom, you can always just email ethics at Kent Place and I can forward them to him as well. Thank you, Dr. Wartenberg. Thank That's you, Doc. Thank you, everyone. It's great. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sally. Thank and you. Thank you, Primary. Thank you. you always show up. I love you for that. I absolutely love you for that. <laughs> thank you so much. It's great. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. I want to thank you, Dr. Wartenberg, first of all, for finally meeting you. We met, we spoke last year when uh, we spoke about Ariel without her knowing, but uh, this is really uh, wonderful. I really, yeah. yeah, I really enjoyed it. And I think it was so beneficial for the people who were able to go to today. Well, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to do something um, that hopefully has some benefit for everybody. Definitely. You definitely have gotten us all thinking and, and thank you. And well, Adney, to have thank all you. your teachers here was fabulous. I know. That was fantastic. And, and I didn't hold anything over their heads. I, didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I just said, come join me this afternoon. I said it this morning and my, every morning I send them a, a pick me up note. And uh, today was thankful Thursday. And by the way, come join me this afternoon. So that it was great. Fantastic. Yeah. Really great. Yeah, great, great. Yeah. So hopefully we can get together again. And thank you again, Dr. Wartenberg. Uh, yeah. I got a little sentimental because I remember when one of my sons was reading that book, you oh. know, as a young reader. <laughs> so it was very, very special. Thank you. This well, thank was great. Thank you, Dr. Rizak. Yes. Thank well, you, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ariel. Yeah. Let's do some more. Yes. Okay.
All right. <laughs> I'll see you tomorrow. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you, and thank thank you. you again, Dr. Wartenberg. Good night. Dr. Wartenberg. Thank you.